Welcome to the inaugural 2018 Animal Science and Forage webinar. This series has, is provided by the Alabama Cooperative Extension Service Animal Science and Forage team. This is a pre-recorded webinar, but you can view this archive of this program and other videos in this series at alabamabeefsystems.com. Since this is, is pre-recorded, you can email questions to Leanne Dillard at alabamaforages at auburn.edu after you view the webinar. Today's topic is grazing management and maximizing forage utilization on cool season forages. I am Dr. Leanne Dillard. I am the current Auburn Forage Extension uh, Specialist uh, for Alabama. So why should I care about grazing management? Grazing management is simply the largest return on your investment in a livestock system. Pastures um, and feed for our animals are our largest expense in any livestock operation. And by being able to graze rather than to feed stored feeds or hay, we're able to reduce our costs. So this graph shows productivity on a per animal versus a per acre basis. A lot of times we like to focus on our per animal production. And in that system, underutilizing our forage or undergrazing is actually going to provide the most uh, productive animal. And overgrazing, of course, is going to reduce our performance by limiting the amount of forage available and also limiting the quality of the forage. However, if we focus on production per acre, which is the dashed line, we can see there's actually it becomes a bell curve. And there's a very obvious middle in which we um, should goal have our goal to be the optimum. So in this system, our optimum is um, on the continuum between under and over grazing. So this is going to be um, determine our grazing pressure. Now a lot of factors go in determine what this number is, and that's going to be your soil fertility, your forage species, the number of animals you have, your topography, the weather, and a variety of other uh, factors. But we do know that there is an optimum, and we should shoot for this optimum or within, well within our uh, margin of error there. So again, on grazing management, the key to grazing is rest. This is the number one thing we can do to our pasture system to increase its productivity. The picture on the right shows two days, seven days, or 21 days between clippings of this forage. And you can see when you look at the root biomass that the two-day clipping regime has the least root mass compared to seven or 21 days. Even seven days is less than 21. In a continuously grazed pasture system, which is a typical system, especially in Alabama, most pasture plants are grazed every two to seven days, depending on the preference given to animals. So you can see that with only a week's worth of rest, we're still going to have a reduced plant uh, root biomass. Now this is important especially in years like last year where we had a drought and you can imagine the more root mass that's available the more area there is for plants to take up water and the more able they're able to reach further into um, the ground to get water. So this becomes really uh, obvious in years where we may have limited water supply. It's also going to allow the plants to put up more nutrients as well which is going to inc further increase their productivity and quality. With our recommended rest period of about 21 days, the roots will redevelop to approximately the same depth as uncut plants. That's the rule of thumb we typically say, is the height of your grass is the depth of your roots. So keeping our grass consistently at two to three inches throughout the year is only gonna mean that we have a root mass that only goes about two to three inches into the soil. So in this graphic, the green uh, represents our forage or our above ground plant tissue, and the brown is our root system, so our below ground plant tissue. If we graze or cut it, we can see we cut off the green part. Uh, we know, all know it's green because there's photosynthesis in the leaves, and photosynthesis is how, our, is how plants get their energy. As regrowth begins, because plants do get their energy from photosynthesis, they put all of their reserves into letting the making the leaves grow back. Because of this, they're unable to support so much root biomass and their roots will die back. Now this isn't all bad, this is a typical process, this is nature, and those uh, root biomass actually becomes organic matter, which is important. 
But if we graze and cut again before the plant is able to completely replenish it, its uh, nutrient reserves by putting on enough leaf biomass, the roots will buy back even further because it's not able to support it. It doesn't have enough energy. However, if we give it an adequate rest period, it's actually able to put back the leaves as well as put energy towards root development. So again, once we've had an adequate rest, we can then clip again. And while our roots will die back, they will regrow. So continuous grazing, this is the typical system we see um, throughout Alabama and most of the world. It's because it's simple, and that's why it's the most commonly used. You may have one or multiple uh, watering sources depending on the amount of pasture you have. But the big thing here is that animals are on a single pasture for the entire grazing season, which in Alabama can be 10 or even 12 months out of the year. This allows the animals to selectively graze, and we've all seen it. Animals prefer certain areas be it because there's uh, more nutritious grass going there, because there's a uh, species difference and they prefer that species of forage there, but they're gonna go back to certain areas. This does lead to the high individual performance of some cattle. So we all see those cattle that are gonna produce well no matter what. They're gonna be doing very, very well. But then we're gonna have some cattle that are just not gonna be as thrifty. So our overall performance of our cattle, our average performance is actually gonna be reduced. This is also least efficient from a forage standpoint because we're allowing the, since we're allowing the animals to be more selective, they're going to be trampling more, they're going to be um, leaving more space um, where they're going to lie down, they're not forced to eat it, so it's actually less efficient and you're leaving more grass on the ground. So in a simple rotational grazing system, we'll say in this case we split our pasture into just four different sections. And that can be different depending on how many animals you have, what kind of forage you have, how much acreage you have. So the animals graze to a desired height before moving to a new paddock. If you have a grazing stick from Alabama Cooperative Extension, you'll have uh, on there, you'll have your recommended start grazing height as well as your recommended stop grazing height for common forages in Alabama. And you can use those numbers out in the field with you. So once you move them, then you're gonna give them one to 15 days uh, during active forage growth. So that, that's not the rest period, that's how often you're gonna move them. So you move them once, either in some situations, in some very intensive situations of grazing dairies, for instance, they may move them twice a day. But typically we're talking about one, uh, once a week or uh, once every two weeks. And then here I have one watering source that is um, common to all of the different paddocks. Um, you can have a different system depending on whether you're able to create this um, from scratch or you're dealing with some already some infrastructure. Um, this is called the wagon wheel approach where you're going to be moving the animals in a circle around the one single watering source. You also could have multiple watering sources so you had one in each paddock. So another option is what I call strip rotational grazing. So this is a type of rotational grazing, but instead of moving in a circle or in squares, you're actually gonna be moving uh, strips. This does use a back fence, so don't get it confused with strip grazing or frontal grazing, because um, in this case, you will need a back fence. Um, also, you will need a mobile water source. Um, it's not feasible, typically, to have a watering source in every single strip. Also, your strip is gonna be dependent on how fast your grass is growing and how many animals you have, so it may be different during different parts of the year. Um, so there's um, some different ways to have a mobile water source, but that is one uh, kind of pitfall of this system. Frontal grazing, which I mentioned just a second ago, sometimes it's called strip grazing. This is the, similar to the last system, except for there's no back fence. You only need one watering source because uh, the animals are allowed access to those areas they've already grazed. This is the preferred system for stockpiled forages. Since the forages are not actively growing, there's no need for them to have a rest. So it's okay that the animals still have access to those areas. So here's some grazing rules of thumb. Like I mentioned, if you do have uh, the Alabama grazing stick, these numbers are on there. Um, but for those of you that don't, um, here's just some general numbers. Um, if you have alfalfa, you're gonna wanna start grazing at 10 to 16 inches and in grazing at two to four with a recommended uh, rest date of two uh, weeks to a month. Again, a lot of this is gonna be dependent on what time of year it is because during times of more active growth, then your rotation can be shorter um, and have le less rest period. During times of slower growth, you wanna give the forages more uh, rest period. 
If you have small grains, um, for instance, there towards the bottom, you, have, you want to begin grazing at about a foot tall, and you can graze them down to about four inches. And then rest period of down, uh, maybe only a week to 30 days. Um, these typically will be um, more actively growing. They are annuals. Tall fescue, um, you want to start grazing at 48 inches. In grazing, will even be a little bit lower, two to three inches, um, and then recommended rest period of two weeks to a month, uh, similar to alfalfa. So just a comparison of the different systems to give you an idea of why um, rotational grazing is so much more efficient. So in this table, we have available forage, either 1,500, 2,000, or 2,500 dry, uh, dry matter pounds per acre, and comparing a continuous stocking a moderate rotational stocking system, so that's you know four or five paddocks, and then frontal grazing where you're going to be doing the strip grazing with the back fence. So continuous stocking, um, you're going to get about 19 to 25 cow days per acre. So cow days per acre, for those of you not familiar with it, that basically means that's how many uh, cattle days you'll be able to graze. So you could graze one cow for 25 days per acre, or you could graze two cows at about 12 and a half uh, days um, per acre, or, you know, as you go up, you see. So that's how often you would need to, you know, how much efficiency you're going to have for the 1,500. For moder moderate rotational staking, you're going to increase that by about 10 days. So that could be increasing your animal uh, stocking rate or your specific stocking density for that time of year, or also just be able to, um, put better condition on the animals you already have. Frontal grazing is even more um, uh, efficient where you can get upwards of almost 50 animals per acre, or excuse me, cow days per acre. You can see as the amount of forage dry matter goes up, this trend continues. So frontal grazing is still the most efficient by far, um, even at 2,500 pounds of dry matter per acre. So a lot of times people ask me, how do I start rotational grazing? It seems really intimidating at times. But the, big, the first thing to do is just take a pasture inventory. What pastures do you have? How much acreage? Um, where are your water sources currently located? What is the soil fertility? If you haven't done a soil sample in several years, take them. You'll need to take one per, in each area, um, at least one per uh, 10 acres but um, one in each pasture. Because you may have, and you may already know that you have some pastures that are more productive than others. Seek advice, either through myself and Cooperative Extension, or um, reaching out to producers you may know that have been working with rotational grazing, but always you know, talk to someone and see what their experience has been like. Identify cost share opportunities. Um, for example, through NRCS, um, they have cost share to put in cross fences and waters, and this may be able to help you uh, build some of the infrastructure that's necessary to um, start rotational grazing. And sketch out the ideal. In a perfect world with no limitations of money, what would you like to have? Um, what would make the most sense for you? Then develop a phase-in plan. This doesn't need to be an overnight situation. Um, if you have a 100-acre pasture and you simply put one cross fence in so you have two 50-acre pastures, that's movement in the right direction. Don't think you have to do everything at, uh, immediately. Also, it's better to take it slowly because um, sometimes you may think that on paper this is the best place for a fence to be located, but actually in reality it's not because you didn't think about how the animals needed to move. So at first, um, using temporary fence is a really good tool in order to help you get used to moving the cattle. When you need to move the cattle, it requires you to actually go in the pasture and be with the grass um, so that you can train your eyes. Um, but it is very laborious, um, but it helps you walk the pastures more. Once you realize where the best place to have pastures, you have a, your eyes are kind of calibrated to know when you need to move the animals, then you can go in and put in more permanent fence, which will make it easier to move cattle. But build in flexibility. Um, I think that's kind of the trend that's been going on in the last couple of years is that we have to be flexible. Um, last year in 2016, or excuse me, two years ago now, uh, we had a huge drought and a lot of us didn't even have enough hay to be able to make it through the winter because we weren't able to, we started feeding hay in June. Um, and then last year, 
Uh, some people got an, a lot of great hay, and then other people weren't able to cut hay due to the tremendous amount of rain. But build in flexibility um, to give yourself, uh, de dependent on what the environmental conditions, but also what maybe your um, farm plan may be in the future. So what are our rules of thumb? A two to four day rotation works the best for most beef operations. Um, there's really no need to be more intensive than that. Um, you can do a longer rotation, but you're going to reduce your efficiency, which is kind of the point of rotational grazing, so that should be our goal, but moving about twice a week. For tall fescue-based pastures, we want about 10 to 15 paddocks about base, uh, works best based on the average growth of, of those pastures throughout the year. So that would see you would have, you know, a couple of days on each, so you've been moving your animals through those 15 paddocks. So you want to allow about 24 to 30 day rest period. So again, if you had 15 paddocks and you're on a two day rotation, um, you can see easily you'd be getting 30 days of rest during your, uh, your um, tall fescue. So you get maximum growth. And also think about how you're gonna move your animals. Where do you need to locate gates and those sorts of things? If there's a road, how are you gonna get animals across the road if your farm is in multiple locations? You know, what's the contingency of being able to move them uh, to a, another area? Um, these are all things we must keep in mind. Another thing is you wanna place water within 400 to 600 feet of all parts of the paddock. Um, in some cases, this may mean you need more than one water source per paddock. But the reason being is the animals are going to have to walk from the water multiple times a day. In the summer, it may be, you know, a lot, a lot of walking um, in order to stay hydrated. So if you're trying to put condition on a cow and she's having to walk a quarter of a mile um, multiple times a day to get to water, she's not going to be able to do that. So we want to make sure the animals are not having to stay on their feet. Not only would they be using energy to walk, but also that's limiting the amount of time they've been grazed. You want to isolate your shade, mineral feeder, and water from one another, so you don't want to group them up because that's going to make a place for animals to congregate. By separating those out, you're going to be able to distribute your nutrients better um, that from the defecation and urination, but you're also going to get more utilization of your forages by making the animals move. And you want to place your shade away from the paddock entrance. We don't want to make a muddy spot right where we're going to be putting in equipment. Um, make sure that that's away so that we're trying to keep, especially where we're bringing equipment, not so muddy. So grazing calculations. Um, these are um, some calculations just dependent. You can do these, um, and I will go through all of them, but depending on whether you have a fi fixed acreage but a variable amount of cattle, or if you have a certain number of cattle and you're trying to figure out how many acres you may need to rent, you can go forwards or backwards here. So working forwards, if we have available acres, um, say we have 100 available acres and we wanna know what paddock size we have, a number of paddocks, then you know, say if we want um, 10 paddocks, then we're gonna have our pack size is gonna be uh, 10 acres a piece. Working on paddock size, this will give us an idea, again, if you want to um, determine pack size for your current herd or you can fill in the numbers and determine um, what your pack size will actually allow and that number of head. Um, you're going to put in your average animal weight um, depending on what class of livestock you have. If you have cow calf say you're going to have about 1100 pounds plus you need to put in the, the average weight of your calves. Your percent dry matter intake which is going to be dependent on what types again what class of cattle you have. If you're looking at dry pregnant animals it may be you know two percent of body weight. If you're looking at stockers it may be three percent. Um, so these are numbers you can get them um, from uh, ACES publications on that. The number of heads so how many cattle you have. How many days you want them to be in the paddock and those are going back to those grazing numbers I gave you earlier. How much rest period you need um, and how long you might eat graze. That is going to be flexible depending on what type of time of the year it is. In the forage, you may have times where you need to graze more frequently to get keep your forage from getting too high and maturing, or the may, other times you want to move them more slowly because your grass is not growing as fast. Then you're going to divide that by your available forage difference. This is going to be the amount of forage you have minus the amount of forage you want to leave. And so if you have a grazing stip, you can look at that again back to those inches we want to start grazing versus our inches we want to stop grazing. 
you want to do that in terms of pounds of dry matter, there's a quick conversion on the grazing stick of how to do that. Also, um, you can look that up on our ACES publication, the conversion of inches of canopy to pounds of dry matter. And your grazing efficiency, which is going to be dependent on, again, those graphs I showed you um, here, that they're going to be continuous stocking of 30 to 40 percent in a slow rotation, so moving more than uh, less than once a week. It's only about half um, efficiency. Increasing that to more than once a week, you're going to be grazing uh, 60 to 70 percent, about two thirds. And strip grazing is going to give you um, pushing 80 percent or three quarters of your efficiency. So also we can calculate our number of paddocks by simply the days of rest we need to give our forage um, slash divided, excuse me, divided by the number of paddock days in our paddock plus one. So in this case, if we want to give 14 uh, days of rest for our fescue, um, and then we want to do two days per paddock, that's going to be um, seven plus one is eight. That means we would need eight paddocks. So what's so great about rotational grazing is that it causes our manure to be more uniformly distributed um, when the grazing pressure is temporarily increased on a pasture. Now from an environmental standpoint, this is really great because it's gonna reduce um, our environmental pressure, but also from a soil fertility standpoint, because we're gonna have more uniform distribution of our nutrients. Um, and so that means our forages are gonna be more uniformly productive and have similar quality, um, where we're gonna have more differences in continuous to graze system. So what are the impacts of overgrazing? We're gonna get, again, unequal nutrient distribution. Um, animals are gonna to tend to congregate in areas um, and defecate and urinate there. Increased risk of compaction, um, especially in those areas. This also will lead to eventually, um, as any of you are feeding hay right now, um, before the ground froze at least, you know there's probably a really good mud pit around your hay ring if you don't move it. So you can see that not only are you gonna have compaction, but you're also gonna actually mess up your your sod and have to replant that area and you're going to increase water and soil loss as runoff and so your increased water um, on the surface may not be seem so bad until you think about times of drought when you really could use all that little bit of water to be infiltrated so when you have a more uniform forage you're going to have more infiltration which is important for your long-term productivity of your pastures so now looking at the same efficiencies um, I mentioned earlier, um, but comparing that to a haze system, for those of you who do any mechanized harvest, when you compare that, haze, haze system will be anywhere from 30 to 70% efficient. And this is extremely variable because there's so many factors here. It would be how you cut, um, how you rake, uh, the drying amount, if you store your hay outside, are all gonna increase your waste here. So you can have very low utilization in a hay system. Silage has less factors um, because you're just doing a partial wilt. So you're gonna have more efficiency, 60 to 85%. Green chop is the most efficient because when you're using a machine, there's no selection involved whatsoever. So you're gonna get the most uh, there, but you're directly putting it in and feeding it wet. So you're gonna get, you're gonna have no wilting walls. But you can see by strip grazing or uh, using a moderate rotation, you're gonna actually have the same uh, efficiency as you would in a silage or even a green chop system. The important take home point here is that grass grows grass. We, if we do not leave any grass on the ground, we're not gonna, it's not gonna be able to grow back. Um, especially, you know, in any system that we're going to have, think about a perennial. We want that grass there for many years. That's, it's, we want to take advantage of the fact that it's a perennial. So we need to make sure that there's something there because what we, little we see above ground, there's even less below ground. Now getting into some, some specific grasses um, for Alabama. I think most of us are familiar with the tall fescue line that grows through central Alabama. Um, the yellow area here being where we can grow tall fescue um, and the red being where we can't. So we're going to talk about tall fescue first and then I'll move into annuals. But tall fescue is our most common um, warm season, uh, cool, excuse me, cool season perennial. We can grow orchard grass in that extreme uh, northeastern corner, um, but it's used in a much lesser extent. Persistency is not nearly as great on orchard grass um, in Alabama as compared to tall fescue. Um, we can grow it in North and Central Alabama and into the Black Belt, um, as you can see here. So throughout the U.S., it's the most common cool season perennial. 
Um, older varieties, like most of us have heard of Kentucky 31, can cause fescue toxicosis. And you can see here in this blue um, microscope slide, you see the little squeaky line that is the fungus that causes fescue toxicosis. Um, but it's really important because as we've seen, um, this is why it is responsible for the persistency of Kentucky 31 and other fescues. Um, when we take the fungus out, the fescue does not uh, persist very well, as we saw with the uh, indified free fescues. However, it does cause fescue toxicosis. So now we have the availability of having new endophyte varieties like Max-Q and Jessup that don't contain a toxic endophyte. So these are more persistent or similar in persistency to Kentucky 31, but do not cause fescue toxicosis. So what's the problem with fescue toxicosis? What do you see? You see your animals spend less time grazing because they're standing in a, a mud pit. They spend more time seeking out water, shade, to relieve heat stress. And they'll actually make a mud pit. If, they're, if you don't typically see something there, you'll see them actually make a mud pit in order to, um, where they're wallowing where it's cool. They'll have a rough hair coat, so they're not going to slick up in the spring like we would like. And even in some cases, their extremities may begin to slough off their tail, their hoofs, because uh, the endophyte causes vasoconstriction. But what you can't see is decreasing intake. Anytime the animal is not eating, it's not going to be taking in grass. It's going to be standing in water. It's not going to be eating. This decreases our average daily gain, which is really important in stock persistence, but also in cow-calf as well, where you're going to be paid on your, uh, you know, your calf weight. Also, the, the cow will not be as productive because she's not eating. Vasoconstriction reduces the blood flow to reproductive organs. That's why we see reduced pregnancy rates. It also causes the animals to not to be, um, have elevated body temperatures because they can't deal with heat stress. We see this even more so, it's ex excuse me, exa it's exasperated by the fact that many cattle in Alabama are black, which already don't have the same heat tolerance just due to their color. So you add on fescue toxicosis on that and they, they really are, have a hard time dealing with the temperature. So for those of us who do have Kentucky 31, which is most people, and we don't have the money to do a complete renovation, how do we manage hot fescue? The big one is to control seed head emergence. The seed head concentrates the ergot, so by consuming seed heads, they're actually going to be taking in more of the fescue to uh, the toxic uh, endophyte. We can do this through mechanical clipping or chaparral application. You want to avoid grazing during the hottest months. Um, even in the northern reaches of Alabama, we're not going to have fescue growing from June, July, or August. So we need to take those animals off those pastures, not only to give the fescue a rest because it needs a rest, but also in order to reduce um, the, the amount of fescue those animals are consuming when the temperatures are so high. You can see this picture here was taken in uh, North Georgia, just over the line from center Alabama in mid-May. And you can see this black cow here in the foreground. She slicked up pretty nice. There are seed heads present, as you can see uh, in the picture, but there's not complete seed head emergence. So this cow is either she's just going to be more thrifty, or my, my guess is that she's just not, uh, she's grazing around the, the seed heads. As you can see, her head's down pretty low. But it also is not that hot during this time. This, like I said, was mid-May. But you see the same field in, in June. That animal was probably suffering from fescue toxicosis. You can also plant legumes or complementary grasses. Clovers do really well with fescue. Um, and that is, becomes the, you may have heard the adage that dilution is the solution. Dilution is part of the solution, yes. Um, so that we can just give them an option to eat something to help reduce those um, symptoms. You can also supplement livestock with non-infected hay. So if you're grazing uh, fescue um, and you need to give some more supplement, feed them Bermuda grass hay or a novel endophyte fescue hay. You can, the pastures that you need to renovate, I would suggest renovating them with novel endophyte tall fescue. These have been shown to be just as persistent as Kentucky 31, unlike their endophyte free counterparts, which were not. And they don't have the same problems with uh, fescue toxicosis. Moreover, unlike the endophyte free, which could turn into endophyte uh, tall fescue, because the in, there is an endophyte there that's just not uh, toxic, typically uh, we see that they stay non-toxic long term. They don't revert to Kentucky 31. 
So tall fescue does really well for stockpile, fall stockpiling. It's very well suited because we do get some growth during the fall, not nearly as much as we would in the, the spring. But what you can do is if you do a late summer uh, fertilization, then you're able to, you know, uh, fescue is very responsive to nitrogen, put in a lot of little oomph in its growth, and then be able to save that. Um, you're going to graze this in the winter when fescue is dormant and it reduces your hay needs. So you'll be feeding this this time of year during January when you're, when you're typically going to be feeding hay and we know that your fescue is not growing. You can use frontal mat grazing to maximize utilization. You don't want to give them access to the whole paddock at the same time. They'll trample a lot and waste a lot. You don't need a back fence though because since the fescue is not grazing, it doesn't need a rest period. So how would I go about this? You're going to graze or mow grass to about three to five inches by late summer. Um, this is going to be different depending on where you are located in the state, but right before your fescue starts to grow, we want to cut that down. When your growth begins in the fall, so August, early September, you're going to apply 40 to 80 pounds of nitrogen per acre, again, to kind of give it that boost um, in growth. If you don't fertilize it, you're not going to see as much productivity. Keep the animals off and allow the forage to accumulate until hay would otherwise be fed. So again, that's going to be depending on the year, but we'll say January 1. And then January 1, you're going to start feeding it through strip grazing. So this um, table is from the University of Kentucky showing the effects of nitrogen, different ni nitrogen application rates on fescue, uh, stockpiled fescue compared to that of Kentucky bluegrass. So even with no nitrogen application, the tall fescue uh, averaged 1,700 pounds of dry matter with 11% crude protein. It is lower in quality than Kentucky bluegrass, but it's much higher yielding. For as we increased up to 90 uh, pounds of nitrogen per acre, we saw that we got almost 4,000, so two tons of dry matter per acre and pushing 15% crude protein. That is sufficient for most cattle, cow calf through the winter. Um, at the lower amounts of crude protein, you may need to supplement. Um, you may also need to supplement energy, depending on what your energy analysis is. But in this case, you're at least probably meeting at the 14.8% your crude protein requirement. So this graph is the average of several different studies throughout a variety of states, um, showing the average daily gain in grazing days um, for calves grazing stock, stockpiled tall fescue. So in this, um, the research got um, anywhere from 42 to 63 uh, grazing days. And as you can see, the further south it was, it seemed like there were more grazing days. So we're going to say that if Kentucky they can get 60, I would say easily we could get 60 here. That's two months. Um, a lot of places in Alabama probably could get away with only feeding hay for two months. So that may mean that you can almost reduce, reduce or maybe even eventually eliminate your hay needs. On top of that, when they looked at the average daily gain, they were seeing one to two pounds or more than two pounds uh, per day on their calves. So you can see it was nutritious enough to support those gains, similar to maybe what you would be getting on feeding just fescue hay. Now moving on to cool season grasses like annuals, um, these would be things like small grains. Wheat, oat, rye, triticale um, is another one. Annual ryegrass and brassicas, which are things like turnip, rate, t-raptor. These can grow statewide. They're mainly used in South Alabama where you cannot grow cool season perennials. Uh, but also in North Alabama with insistent and stalker systems where they may need more nutritional forages. So how do all of these kind of compare? There's a lot of different annual grasses that we can look at um, during this, and, and it's at first blush, it's kind of hard to tell which one would be the best. So when we look at annual ryegrass, which is our most common, we're going to see it's extremely productive but it's only productive later in the spring. We're really gonna miss out on any production during the winter. So we're still gonna be needing to feed hay. But it can produce upwards of two or more tons of dry matter per acre. When we look at oats, we can see they're not nearly as productive as um, annual ryegrass, but they are gonna give us some fall production, which we are not really gonna see with the annual ryegrass in November, December. Now, wheat is going to be similar um, to that of oats. It's going to be a little more productive in the spring, a little less productive in the fall, but you can see how it kind of overlaps. Now, if we add in rye, rye is going to be uh, is a 
earlier, more cold tolerant small grain, so it's gonna be more productive in the winter, but kind of peter out earlier. It's also gonna be more productive in the fall. And if we add on brassicas, we're gonna get a lot of growth in the fall and early winter. Um, they're not very grazing tolerant, so they're gonna kind of wane out really fast. But you can see if we plant mixtures, say of brassicas, rye, uh, wheat, and ryegrass, we can have production from say Thanksgiving all the way to Memorial Day, depending on the year and depending on where you are, which means no feeding uh, hay whatsoever. Um, this is, you know, like I said, it's dependent on a lot of things, but this is what our goal should be. So in these systems, it's really about mixing a variety of different forages together that are going to be complementary. Now this fall production is contingent on early planting date as well as the weather that year. So how do all these measure up in terms of quality? Ryegrass can be for anywhere from 10 to 20% crude protein with 56 to 74% total digestible nutrients. And again, as I mentioned there, it's the most productive. Oats and wheat are very similar in both quality and production. Rye is very similar in terms of quality with a little less production, but again, it produces earlier on. So it allows us to have um, a couple extra grazing weeks in, in the winter. Now I did not mention clovers in the previous slide, but if you do include clovers, they're gonna obviously be very high in crude protein, very high in total digestible nutrients, but the thing with clovers and legumes, they're not very productive, so you wanna mix those with the grasses in order to maximize both your quality and your production. So how am I gonna utilize these? Um, there's a variety of different ways. Um, one, the main one being rotational grazing. We talked about how to do that earlier. This is the perfect fit for stalkers, replacement heifers, and finishing animals. Animals that have a high nutrient requirement. But most of us aren't in those systems and are typically gonna have cow-calf pairs or dry cows. In this situation, you wanna use it as a supplement. You wanna limit graze. And how do you do that? You're gonna graze, you can do it a variety of different ways. Basically, you're just not gonna let the animals have it 24 seven. So you can graze two to three hours per day on that one pasture and then move them to another paddock. Or you can give them eight to 12 hours one day, three to four, every three to four days. Or 24 hours every seven days. Really, you just wanna make sure they get what they need and then move them off before they can gorge themselves and either get too high in condition so they're limiting reproductive, uh, their pregnancy rates or causing dystocia or really just wasting money. Um, what you can do if you are doing this is offer either them put in a dry lot with some low quality hay um, or put them on stockpiled warm season grasses during the off period so that they're, you know, they're gorging themselves on ice cream for one day, but then you're going to give them brand cereal the other days to balance it out. I would like to mention that there will be a forage field day at Sand Mountain Research and Extension Center on February 22nd. This is located at 13112 uh, Alabama Highway 68 in Crossville. Speakers will include Dr. Kim Mullenix, the Beef Cattle Extension Specialist, Dr. Rishi Prasad, the Nutrient Management Extension Specialist, myself, the Forage Extension Specialist, Kent Stanford, our, an additional Nutrient Management Specialist, as well as Landon Marks, who is the um, Regional Animal Science and Forage Agent in that area. Um, if you have any questions or you can refer to Landon, you can look up him on uh, his um, ACES, you can look up his email address and contact him for more information. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, email me at alabamaforages at auburn.edu. Um, you can also visit our websites, alabamaforages.com or alabamabeefsystems.com. Please follow us on Facebook, Forage Focus and Alabama Beef Systems. Thank you for watching the first 2018 Animal Science and Forage webinar, and uh, that's provided by ACES Animal Science and Forage team. This, this is a new year, and this is a new series for our Animal Science and Forage webinar series. Next month, we'll, on February 14th, we'll have Dr. Audrey Gamble. She will be talking about improving soil health systems and grazing systems. It'll also be at 10 a.m., just like all of our other webinars, and you can find more information at alabamabeefsystems.com. If you are not uh, part of our mailing list and don't get our newsletter, please sign up on alabamabeefsystems.com and you'll be alerted of our webinars and any other events we're having.